Hello everyone and welcome to Crown Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic, we review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sabobala Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Today, we are reviewing a recent paper published in JAMA Surgery, followed by a teaching session on hypothesis testing by Professor Saba Balasubramanian. Today, we are going to talk about a paper that was recently published on JAMA Surgery titled Clinical Effectiveness of the Elder Friendly Approaches to the Surgical Environment Initiative in Emergency General Surgery. Uh, this paper comes from two Canadian institutions. Uh, the leading one uh, is the University of Alberta. Uh, and the second one is uh, pretty close to it, about 300k in uh, uh, close for Canadian standards, let's say. Right, uh, Josh, uh, what do you think about this? Uh, have I hooked you up with this paper? In the last year, we have seen quite a few big size studies related to elderly uh, emergency surgery, frailty and mortality. and. Um, namely, it's the health study um, published last year and also a JAMA study. And they have all found that uh, frailty has, um, has related to um, an increase of um, mortalities. But unlike the orthopedics, um, they have been having geriatrician assessment for a while now. Um, but we haven't got it, haven't we? And uh, we've got no evidence that it works. So um, I'll be interested to know what's, what this study show. Cool. Great. Thanks for that. Right, <clears throat> let's crack on then. So what's the aim of this paper? Very simply, to develop and assess the effect of an elder-friendly approaches to the surgical environment, which we'll be calling ease from now on, uh, in an emergency uh, surgical setting. So Josh, if I have to picture this in a, a PICO format, uh, how would it look like? So uh, the, of, is the, of the title say, patient will be elderly, um, will have emergency surgery, the infant pension will be the East Bundle, which we're going to explain to you exactly what exactly is East Bundle. The comparison is East and non-East Bundle, and the outcome will be looking at major mortality and, um, and complication and length of stay structures. Fantastic, yes. We'll dig into the outcomes a little bit uh, more in a second. Right, so let's dig into their methods. Well, uh, this is a prospective non-randomized control before and after study. Now, we'll uh, find out what before and after study means uh, in a few seconds. Um, they enrolled patients between 2014 and 2017, uh, 65 years old or older, uh, undergoing an emergency general surgical admission that included a procedure with it. Uh, any admission that did not respond to these characteristics was excluded from the study. Uh, also, very rightfully, uh, they took off uh, uh, every patient that was coming from a high dependent uh, area, such as coming from a nursing home or acquiring a lot of care at home. Well, if you're trialing a bundle uh, to get patients back on their feet, there's no point in including patients that are not on their feet to start with. Now, let's uh, find out a bit more about that before and after um, methodology. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's uh, two uh, centers involved in this. Uh, from now on, we call them center one and center two. Uh, now, uh, at some point uh, between 2014 and 2017, in center one, they implement the ease bundle. Now, uh, Josh, uh, remind me, what are the four pillars of the ease bundle? Yeah, so the, there are four com major components to the ease bundle. So number one is good pain of patient. They send all patients uh, to the same ward pre and post operatively. Uh, B is they have a very heavy geriatrician assessment invo and involvement um, and they get seen by a geriatrician regularly. Three is um, they have a very good dedicated nursing team and physio team um, targeted at elderly uh, patients. And eventually the last thing is they have a um, um, very good discharge team and they make sure patients get discharged as soon as possible so they don't sit around in the hospital after operation. So once they're ready, they will, will be discharged and downstream. Fantastic. Yeah, so before and after means very simply before the implementation of the bundle and after the implementation of the bundle. Uh, 
further, a very important point here uh, is that in Center 2, uh, they didn't do a thing. So uh, they implemented no change and they used Center 2 uh, as a control center uh, to account for any potential background variables that could affect uh, outcomes of the patients, regardless of this bundle itself. Uh, so this is called the DID or difference in differences methodology. And obviously it works only if the same problems or the same changes affect both center one and center two at the same time, with the exception of this bundle, obviously. Right. Um, Josh, uh, what do you think about this type of methodology? Have you come across it before? Yeah, so uh, this before and after study is, is well endorsed by the Cochrane. And um, I, I appreciate it that if they find it difficult to randomize um, this group of patients um, if they are particularly unwell going for emergency surgery. So I think this is probably an appropriate, most appropriate study to, um, yeah, for, the, for this type of setting. Yeah, absolutely. Right, let's have a look at their outcomes then. Uh, primary outcomes is, is a composite outcome actually, uh, includes Clavian Dindo complications um, of grade three and four, so major complications and in hospital uh, mortality. Uh, secondary outcome is again a composite outcome uh, and includes uh, death and uh, uh, hospital readmissions at 30 days and six months. Minor uh, post-operative complications, so Clavian Dindo uh, type one and two. Uh, discharge to a higher level of care, so if you're coming from home and end up going to a nursing home. Uh, and finally, uh, length of stay. Um, any comments, Josh, on uh, these outcomes, or do you think? Yeah, I think these outcomes are appropriate. Um, it, it, they, they have used a very um, uh, international recognized um, uh, complicated surgical complication scale, haven't they? And I think these are appropriate and what we, what the audience would like to know. Yeah, I agree. I think Clavian Dindo is a standard way to go. And yeah. I think including length of stay uh, and, and discharge for high level of care is fairly relevant from a healthcare economics point of view. Right, so let's dig into their results. Um, as you can see here, uh, they overall enrolled 684 uh, patients. Uh, what I want to highlight here in this chart is that only a relative minority of them um, uh, actually enjoyed the ease bundle on the 140. The vast majority of patients enrolled are in the either uh, pre-site, um, pre-intervention um, uh, group uh, or in the control site. Now, let's have a quick look uh, at how our cohorts um, compare to each other. Uh, Josh, do you want to talk us through uh, this uh, table? Yeah, so um, they have started, the, the patient across the four groups have, uh, obviously they want, you want them to be in similar starting point. So their age, gender, BMI, uh, medication that they are on are, are quite comparable and um, and I, I've noticed that Geo on there that their CFS score is slightly different to the one that we use in the UK, isn't it? Um, yeah, yes, uh, yes and no. So um, the CFS they use is a seven point scale, which is the 2005 Canadian Study of Health and Aging uh, Clinical Frailty Scale. Uh, we use a nine points uh, scale, which is actually the updated version uh, of the same. Um, uh, quickly, uh, the further three points that we have, two points that we have, are actually a breakdown of 0.7. And the patients included in the study are only from group one to six, because group seven are pretty much completely dependent. Uh, they also clustered them into three subgroups. So one and two are well patients, three and four are vulnerable patients, five and six are frail patients. Right, uh, going back to these cohorts. Uh, one quick comment uh, on uh, this uh, sort of bottom part of the table. Uh, there's a fair amount of laparoscopic cholecystectomies here, uh, which is not something we uh, very often see as a bang on emergency operation. We do them as a hot coli. Would that count as a, an emergency operation? Not entirely sure. It might not be entirely sort of correspondent to what we see uh, in the UK. And the second thing I wanted to highlight here, the hardcore stuff, the NILA stuff, is all down here. Uh, and it represents a relative minority uh, in comparison with the rest. So again, uh, it might be a bit difficult to fit this data into uh, our uh, normal experience. Anyway, well, let's have a look uh, uh, at the results uh, of the implementation of this bundle of care. Um, 
right. First of all, the vast majority of the patients that were supposed to get uh, this bundle enjoyed at least a little bit of it. 92.9% uh, received at least a portion uh, of the bundle itself. And I have to say, uh, they do highlight fairly convincing results. Uh, almost 20% reduction in the composite outcome. What was the composite outcome again, Josh? So it's um, um, obviously mortality and um, Calvin Dindo 3 and 4, isn't it? Yeah, so uh, fairly uh, impressive reduction. Uh, can't really think of a, an intervention uh, so sort of uh, economically feasible that would achieve this uh, in uh, a relatively short implementation time. 20% reduction in total complications as well, which is, again, quite impressive. A three days reduction in uh, length of stay and a 50% reduction in discharge to higher level of care, uh, which are, again, quite relevant uh, from a healthcare economics point of view. They did have some weird results, uh, though, in the control site, uh, didn't they, Josh? Yeah, so in the control site, despite having no intervention, um, the, um, uh, the post-intervention group have a 10% increase in um, total complications. And these are actually uh, uh, statistically significant, and the author didn't really adjust it. Gio, do you think this is just a reflection of um, variation in practice, perhaps a, a bit unlucky? Might be, it might be, but uh, as uh, you recall at the beginning, we were talking about the difference in differences uh, methodology. Uh, I think uh, recording such an increase in complications without an adequate justification might actually be a bit of a hit towards that model because obviously something has happened here that has not happened here, or possibly, I can't say for sure. Something has happened here that has not happened here. So, uh, apart from the um, his bundle, obviously. So that might be a significant threat to validity uh, in terms of uh, the outcomes of this study. It's also worth mentioning that uh, they did not uh, record a sustainable change um, in outcomes, meaning that uh, the 30 days and six months mortality and readmissions rate were actually uh, pretty much the same pre and post ease. So, uh, moving on to the limitations, well, uh, I have to say that the authors uh, actually do a good job in self-reporting, the majority of them, um, the lack of randomization, but uh, as we mentioned earlier on, this is pretty much uh, unavoidable here. Uh, the uh, limitations of the DID approach, the difference in differences approach, they highlighted quite well. And finally, uh, well, this is a bundled intervention, so uh, you can't really break down the bundle and find out which element was particularly effective uh, in generating the output. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, I think there is a replicability uh, issue, um, particularly with the type of operations these patients underwent. Uh, but I think, again, that the big, biggest threat to validity is uh, the DID approach. Right, so to conclude, um, in the words of the authors, uh, an elder-friendly approach to the surgical environment is clinically effective in a general surgery emergency setting. And uh, just to summarize the main points that we discussed throughout this presentation, I'm uh, popping up this perspective table. So, um, we'll talk uh, about hypothesis testing, which is a key aspect of scientific methodology. And um, we, and we'll spend a little bit of time on the principles and then I have a few sort of scenarios with some questions. So we'll start off with um, talking about what a hypothesis is. So essentially a hypothesis is simply an idea, a specific idea or a statement or a premise that needs to be tested. As opposed to a theory, which is a general statement about a series of phenomena that people generally accept that has been proven previously. OK, so that's what a hypothesis is. Now, you could derive a hypothesis from observations. Now, let's just take an example of obesity and infection risk uh, after laparotomy. And that's just an example that I'll use for the purpose of this particular uh, um, tutorial. So uh, if you as a surgeon have noted that obese patients get a lot of infection, based on your experience, or you've done a study, a small study that shows that morbidly obese patients have a much higher infection rate, then from your observations, either formal or from experience, you have developed this hypothesis whereby you say obesity 
and potentially is associated with infection risk. So that is one way of developing a hypothesis. The other way is deriving a hypothesis from one or a set of theories. So you could say that obesity is associated with poor peripheral circulation, and you could say that poor peripheral circulation or reduced vascularity impairs wound healing, and therefore my hypothesis is that obesity increases infection rate. So that's another way of deducing or deriving a hypothesis. That's from theory. Now, that's the um, example on the side of the screen. So the hypothesis being obesity increases infection rates following laparotomy, and you could have come to this hypothesis based on observations, or you could have deduced this hypothesis from theories. Now, hypothesis, if you have one, is central to your research project or your study. It should be clear, it should be well-defined, it should be specific and not general like a theory, and it should be testable. That's kind of logical. So, my question at this stage, and maybe to Josh, is, Josh, does every research project need a hypothesis? That's the question. What do you think? Um, I think, I think, yes, I think, I think you, I think it's very easily mix it up with the objective and aim of a, of a project. Uh, is that right? And, um, yeah, so the intuitive answer is yes. Logical answer is yes. What do you think, Gio? Sorry, I had my microphone muted. Um, yeah, I agree. I agree. I think it's um, uh, it's yes. Yeah, although I can read your notes in, and it says no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take the notes away. Yeah. So the intuitive answer is every research needs the hypothesis, but that's not necessarily true because there are research questions. My next slide will illustrate this in more detail. But there are research questions that do not have a hypothesis. For example, you could have been taking an interest in infection rates following laparotomy, and you could have asked the question, what are the risk factors for um, infection after laparotomy? So if you ask, what are the risk factors? Or you could ask, I want to know more about the pathogenesis of infection following laparotomy. So there's no hypothesis there. That is what we call exploratory research or research that takes an inductive approach. So the bottom line is not every research needs a hypothesis. Sometimes you find people um, uh, get standing up at meetings and saying, well, your research doesn't have a hypothesis. So it's not really good research. And that's just not right. OK, so keep that in mind. So not every research needs a hypothesis. The next slide hopefully will illustrate that better. OK, so now when we um, do a hypothesis-based research, the question is how do we develop the hypothesis? Now, before we even develop the hypothesis, the key is to start off with the research question or what is the problem that you're trying to address, okay? Now, once you define a problem, then you look at literature and uh, can you see my mouse or my, my arrow? Yes, we can. Yeah. yeah. OK, so you search the literature or you collect your own data to try and see if you can get the background to the problem and if you can get as much information as you can about the problem. With that data, you then generate your hypothesis. OK, so once you've got your hypothesis, you design a study, collect data and test the data to see if the data will support the hypothesis or not. If the data does not support the hypothesis, then you go back to literature, you go back again and go through the cycle again and again. And once you've got a few studies that all support the hypothesis, then the hypothesis becomes a commonly accepted um, truth, if you like. It becomes commonly accepted, almost like a theory, you could say. So going back to our example, the research question could be what factors predispose to infection after laparotomy? So that's a very broad question. And that's a question that uh, doesn't lend it itself to a testable hypothesis. So once you um, collect some data, do a literature review and so on and so forth, you could come up with a hypothesis just to say obesity affects infection rates after laparotomy. 
Okay. So the first part of that uh, of the research that you've done is also a good research because you started off with a problem and you collected data to make observations to then generate a hypothesis. So that itself could be a study. And then you have to obviously complete the cycle, if you like, but testing the, by testing the hypothesis. But it doesn't mean that research without hypothesis or exploratory research is bad research. It doesn't mean that at all. Right. Now we'll go on to types of hypothesis. There are a number of ways in which you can you can categorize hypothesis, and I'll mention a couple and then come to the most um, important um, way of classifying hypothesis in a minute. So. Uh, I've just uh, outlined at the start of what a hypothesis is that you can either get a hypothesis based on observation or you can get to a hypothesis based on a theory. You can deduce a hypothesis based on uh, a set of phenomena. So the first approach based on observation is called inductive, inductive hypothesis. And the latter approach is called deductive or deductive hypothesis. And that's just some useful terms to keep in mind if you're, if you're going to get involved in research. The other way of looking at hypothesis is to see if it is directional or not, non-directional or directional. Now, what does that mean? Again, we'll use the same example. So if you say, if you state that obesity affects infection rate after laparotomy, you're making a clear statement there, but you're not really saying whether it increases the infection rate or maybe it protects against infection. So you're being a bit nuanced or you're being non-committal about the direction and that's called non-directional or some would say bi-directional hypothesis. On the other hand, if you say obesity increases infection rate or you say for some reason obesity actually reduces infection rate, then you're committing yourself to a particular direction in which you think the association is heading towards. So that's called directional hypothesis. Okay, so I hope that's clear. And then we go on to what we call or what you probably all heard of are the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And that's what I'm going to spend another couple of minutes explaining. OK, so the null hypothesis. And um, so I suspect a lot of you have heard of the null hypothesis. Essentially, it is a statement that is generally accepted, but not yet proven without doubt or maybe being debated or contested. So that's what the null hypothesis usually refers to. And then once you have a null hypothesis, you want to collect data to test um, the data set against this particular statement or the null hypothesis. A lot of people um, would say a null hypothesis is the hypothesis of no effect or no association or no difference. But occasionally, and just keep this in mind, it's not wrong if you say that the null hypothesis is the hypothesis of no effect, but occasionally the null hypothesis can have a particular direction or can um, uh, state a, a specific positive or negative association. OK, but in common practice, in most clinical research, you would start off with a null hypothesis. That is the hypothesis of, hypothesis of no association or no difference. For example, no difference between two cancer treatments would be a hypothesis. Right, so our null hypothesis in the example of obesity and infection is that obesity does not influence infection rates following laparotomy. So it is the hypothesis of no association. Now, if you then do a study and test this null hypothesis and then reject the hypothesis because your data doesn't support it, then you've got an alternative hypothesis, often called HA, H alternative, or H1. So that's the opposite of the null hypothesis. OK, so uh, this is something that will be accepted if you have enough evidence to reject your null hypothesis based on the data that you're collecting. All right, so if you have a study that shows that obese patients have the same infection rates as others, then what would be a reasonable conclusion? Um, so your data shows, say, for example, obese patients have a 5% infection rate and non-obese patients have um, a 4% infection rate. Uh, what would be a fair conclusion? And you show that this difference is not significant. Joe, you, you want to take up on that? Yeah. 
Yeah. Geo Josh. You guys still here? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, sorry, I was just saying that, uh, yeah, the null hypothesis would be uh, the one confirmed. Okay, so what you have to be careful in saying is that you are not able to reject the null hypothesis. Yeah, yeah. true. So from a statistical perspective, you don't say that the null hypothesis is confirmed or the null hypothesis is accepted, okay? And this, uh, we can talk about this for 15 minutes, but... Uh, uh, you might need to just spend a little bit of time thinking about this. But what I'm saying is that you ought to remember that you can never conclusively prove the null hypothesis. Okay? So I think it was Einstein that said that I could do a thousand experiments. Okay? I could do a thousand experiments, but I can't prove myself right. I can't prove my hypothesis, but a single experiment can prove me wrong. So the take home message is that the null hypothesis can never be established as the absolute truth. You can only get evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. We'll go on to some examples and we will um, hopefully clarify that a bit further. Right. So when you are doing a, a research study to test a particular hypothesis, there is the potential that you're going to make mistakes or you're going to, your study is, is going to be prone to errors, right? So if you're saying your hypothesis is obesity does not affect infection rates following laparotomy, and then you go about uh, designing a study, it could be a retrospective cohort study, it could be a randomized controlled trial, it could be whatever design. You've done the study, you have to accept that your study potentially can be faulty. And there are two types of faults or errors that clinical studies or research studies potentially can make. They are the type one error and the type two error. Okay, a lot of us have heard about, about the type one and the type two error, and often we tend to forget what they actually mean, um, but hopefully uh, this kind of refresher will um, uh, cement your understanding. So look at this table, just spend a, um, a few seconds looking at the table. So essentially it starts off at the top with you know the null hypothesis, and if you assume that the null hypothesis is true, or if you think that that is the truth in the real world, and you, then you do a study, and if you're unable to reject the null hypothesis, because the data shows that the infection rates are very similar, then you simply say the null hypothesis stands, or I'm not able to reject it, and therefore a lot of, lot of people say, oh, then it's accepted. Although I've just said to you that you can never prove the null hypothesis, but you just accept it because you don't have enough evidence to reject it. So that is the top um, uh, left cell where you say you're not able to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis, hypothesis is actually true. Now, if the null hypothesis is true, but you have rejected it by mistake because the null hypothesis is actually true and obesity is not related to infection, but for some reason you, your study has found a difference, then you've committed what we call a type one error, or it's called alpha, okay? Now, if you take the scenario that the hypothesis is false in that obesity does have an impact on infection, and you have found that, and you've rejected the null hypothesis, then your study is adequately powered, and this is the bottom right cell in green, and the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it's actually false is the power of the study. Okay, now if the null hypothesis is false and your study is unable to reject it, or you're not able to find a difference between infection rates in obese and non obese, then you're committing a type 2 error, also called the beta error. Now, this might be a little bit conf um, confusing to get your head around, but you've got to have a little think about it, and then it'll make sense. It's not um, um, uh, very complicated. It might appear complicated if you're hearing it for the first time. So I'll summarize again, because this is really important. A type 1 error is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is in, in fact true. So 
assuming that obesity doesn't affect infection, and if you found a difference, and if you think there is a difference, then you're committing a type 1 error. Whereas a type 2 error is the probability of you being unable to reject the null hypothesis when it is false. Or, in other words, obesity does affect infection, but you're not able to prove that in your study. Then you're committing a type 2 error. Okay, I hope that makes some sense. If not, you just have to go back to the slides and think about it. Now, both the type 2 error and the power of the study, together, both these concepts are very closely related to sample size, and they're dependent on sample size. And this would be very logical. So if you have a very small study and uh, you're looking for difference, you're not going to be able to find the difference because the studies, um, uh, study has very small sample sizes, okay? So then you, people often will say, oh, your study is not powered enough. In other words, you're more prone to committing a type 2 error. In other words, in a small study, you're not going to be able to find a difference, even if a difference truly exists, okay? So I hope that's that makes some sense, um, and you can feed back if it doesn't. Then the question comes, can you design the perfect study without any error? Josh or Gio, whoever's got the mic on. Well, probably mathematically you can, but not in real life. And why is that? Well, because uh, you don't have, uh, you, you can only make an estimate uh, of um, the uh, sort of the, the um, difference or the uh, or the outcome that you're expecting to pick up. You don't know what the actual difference or the actual outcome is going to be. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, the first thing you have to keep in mind is there's no such thing as the truth, okay? So there's definitely no such thing as the absolute truth, right? And all of your research is being done on samples, not on whole populations. You can't take all patient, every person in the world, you know, potentially subject them to laparotomy, look at the look at the BMI and conclude. So your samples can only be used to make generalizations, and any sample from a population may not necessarily uh, be generalizable or may not take you to what you consider as the absolute truth. And because you're making inferences from samples, you are prone to making errors, okay? So that's the um, uh, reason that it is not possible to design the perfect study, okay? So you do your best to reduce bias, accepting that whatever you do to reduce bias will increase the rigor of your study, but will not eliminate type one and type two errors. If you um, try your best to reduce type one error, you could still be prone to type two error and vice versa. Okay, right, now let's carry on. And um, how much time have we got, Ben? Um, Saba, we're coming up to seven minutes to nine. Um, you've been going for about 19 minutes now. Okay, so another uh, two or three minutes? Yeah, I mean, you've been asking questions as you go. So we've only got one question from the floor. Um, so if you want to continue and then... Okay, I'll ask right. A right, so there's a statement here. Josh, have a look at it. So it says that conventional treatment of thyroid surgery is with open surgery. Robotic thyroidectomy is being compared with open surgery in a trial. And the trial results show that 30-day complication rates are 10% with open surgery, 5% with robotic thyroidectomy, and you've got a p-value of 0 0.8, which has been obtained as a result of you running a Fisher's exact test. So how will you conclude the results of this trial? I'll show you three statements and you just pick up which one you think is the right one. So the first statement says that robotic surgery is better than open surgery, okay? The second statement says states that robotic surgery is no better than, no better or no worse compared to open. And the third is a statement that says there's no evidence to suggest that robotic surgery is different to open surgery as far as infection rates are concerned. I feel like this is a trick question. Um... You talk about sample sizes. So what is the sample size then? I'm not giving you the sample sizes here. 
it, that's all the information right. you have. Um, so from this okay, statement, I've, the, the statement concluded that robot, robotic surgery is bad taste. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, robotic is bad taste, isn't it? From the statement. OK, so um, that's wrong. I'll tell you why, because we're short of time. So I'll just uh, um, whisk yeah. past this. So although it appears that robotic surgery has a 5% complication rate as opposed to 10% in open, and that's it, the, the, the clinical feeling you get is, oh, there's a significant difference. You haven't been able to uh, demonstrate it from a, in a statistical sense, or you haven't been able to prove it, because the statistician would say that difference came about purely due to chance. Just by chance, you got a big difference. So you cannot conclude yet that robotic is better than open. OK, we'll discuss this further in, in, uh, in uh, other uh, tutorials, but the uh, essence here is that you haven't shown a statistical difference, so you cannot say robot is better than open. Now, then you could say, well, can I say robotic surgery is no better or no worse or the same as open? You can't say that because, like I said before, you cannot confirm or prove the null hypothesis. All you can say is that there is no evidence to suggest that robotic surgery is different to open surgery. Okay, so what we're trying to say here again emphasizing that a null hypothesis can be rejected but can never be proven. So if you do a really large study and show that you've got 10 versus 5% rates and a p-value of 0 0.001, then you have the evidence to reject the null hypothesis and then you can say that robotic is better than open. But until then, all you have to say is that we don't have any evidence to say robotic is different to open, okay? This might appear uh, like it's semantics. It certainly isn't. This has got a lot of statistical sense behind it. And often um, we, are, we find it very difficult to get our head around the statistical sense. But this is something that is really important that you need to keep in mind. And we are, when you are writing a paper, this is really, really important. People, um, a lot of us make uh, the mistake of um, confirming that the null hypothesis is true. It is not something that we should. Um, we should keep in mind that it is not something that we should be doing. OK, I'll give you another quick example. I'll ask Gio to comment. So there's a case control study comparing the relationship between smoking and bladder cancer. That shows that 10% of patients smoked and 9% of controls or healthy people smoked. You've got an odds ratio of 1.1 with uh, a 95% confidence interval of 0 0.8 to 1.4, around the odds ratio, with a p-value of 0 0.6. So how will you conclude the results of this study? Again, reiterating exactly what we've talked about. Gio? Yeah, uh, OK. Um, well, again, you can't, you, you can't uh, reject the null hypothesis. You don't yeah. have any statistical data to say the to say that the odds ratio ranges from below one to above one, and the p is not statistically significant. And uh, yeah, correct. So what will you say? How will you explain in your discussion? You will say well, what about that you smoking? cannot say uh, that uh, smoking uh, is uh, statistically associated with um, uh, blood cancer. Yeah, you yeah. cannot say that. Yeah, so you cannot say smoking does not predispose to bladder cancer. All you can say is that you do not have enough evidence. Yeah, you do not have enough evidence to rule out an association between smoking uh, and bladder cancer. That's all you can say. Yeah. Okay. So remember that absence of evidence is because you don't have the evidence doesn't mean evidence of absence or doesn't mean that smoking does not cause bladder cancer. You just haven't been able to establish Prove it. Yeah. OK, so learning point summary, and then we'll go to that question. So we talked about what a hypothesis is. It's essentially a premise or a statement that remains to be tested. OK, keep in mind that not all research needs to have a hypothesis. OK, you can do exploratory research about a particular problem in mind. We talked about the different types of hypothesis, but the most important thing to keep in mind in terms of types are the null and the alternative hypothesis. 
Any hypothesis testing is prone to errors. And the two main types of errors, or, the, or just the two types of errors you can commit, are the type one and type two error. And every study is prone to this, uh, one or uh, one of these errors. And we talked about how to appropriately conclude on the hypothesis based on the data you have. And the key point here is that the null hypothesis cannot be proven beyond doubt. If there's any one point you want to take away from this 15 minute talk is that the null hypothesis cannot be confirmed or established. You can only reject the null hypothesis. Okay, 